Hey friends, welcome back. This is Ashley and Anna with Uncommon Roots Homestead. Tonight we are toasting some s'mores and hunting some hornworms. So we've got our s'mores. I'm gonna go check on Dad, who's already started hunting the hornworms. Do you wanna show him? Oh, okay, pit stop. Meet the newest member. <laughs> he won't be lonely for long. He's getting another little barn kitten friend on Monday. Then tell him that we don't have any toys for me. We brought some toys and there's an ice cream cone in there. <laughs> All right. Let's see where Kevin is. Oh, I see him. Finding any? Hey girl. Can I do uh, it? I found one bogey. Here you so go. Far. Oh, thank you. Can I do this it? This will go great with the worm it, guts. Can I do it, Dad? <laughs> yeah, you want to shine it for me? You got to shine it all. Okay, so the lighting is obviously horrible out there because it's pitch black outside. Um, but we are hunting hornworms tonight. So if you've never heard of that, that's fine. It's not something that a lot of people talk about outside of the gardening community. So hornworms are a, a type of caterpillar, essentially, that um, eat tomato plants, most specifically. They will eat any type of nightshade, but most commonly you find them targeting tomato plants. So um, basically, they're these large, green, nasty caterpillars that can demolish an entire tomato plant in a matter of hours like you come out and your tomato plant looks fine and then all of a sudden it's just a stub and so obviously you want to catch them and find them but the problem is they blend in they're really hard to see during the day you really have to sit and hunt them but at night if you use a black light they actually glow when you hit their body and so what we've done is we have kind of made an evening out of it we came we did some s'mores let the sun go down and now we're out trying to catch all the hornworms that we've seen some damage. So as soon as we see damage in the season, that's when we start coming over in the evening and trying to catch them. Because like I said, they can take down an entire plant in a matter of hours. So you really don't want to let them go unchecked. So let's go see what we can see uh, and see how many we can get. Hey. Hey, we got some tired kids. I know, he's not happy. It's uh, one of the harder tasks when you live 30 minutes away from your farm. Yeah, for sure. You're getting a tell them what I'm doing here? Or? I did. I, I told them a little bit about the purpose behind what you're doing. Yeah, this is a tomato rave, actually. So <laughs> I'm getting the black light out. Ah, what was that? Squirrel. Ooh. It's dark. All right. Let's see if we can find one here. See one? That moon needs to have one. <laughs> the moon has one? No! Hey friends, it is the next day, obviously. We only found one hornworm last night, which is crazy. We definitely have more damage than one hornworm, hornworm could cause. I'm thinking that maybe the birds are helping us out. We looked pretty thoroughly and didn't find any more or else I would have showed you all last night but the kids were getting tired and after about 35 40 minutes we just called it a night we'll continue to monitor for damage we have had a lot of birds that are just kind of hanging around that's not great for fruit in the garden but if they eat the hornworms not the worst thing so uh we kind of i mean following organic and kind of regenerative agriculture standards we 
tend to lean on the side of nature takes care of itself. So whenever you have a really bad problem with a pest or um, with disease, generally it'll fix itself over time if you allow it to. So for instance, if you have a really bad hornworm problem one year, the assumption is that whatever is the predator to the hornworm will come and enter your space and kind of solve it for the next year. So there are lots of things that kind of work that way when you have different um, pest pressure, especially when you're talking about um, bugs. I mean, if you end up with a really bad aphid problem, oftentimes you'll end up seeing ladybugs move into your space and the ladybugs take care of the aphid problem. Um, that doesn't happen in one season, right? It happens over time. And I, I, I watched a really great documentary. If you haven't watched it, you should go um, and look it up right now. Um, it is on Netflix, I believe. Um, but it's called The Biggest Little Farm. And basically they go through these seasons of trying to farm organically. Um, and they were following regenerative agriculture practices um, and creating a really diverse farm. And they found that, you know, with every pest, with every disease, that if they just gave it some time, it ended up balancing it itself out. Um, and they, they found that it took seven years. That balance took seven years, which I think is really cool in and of itself. Um, but that's something to dive into in another day. Uh, but that's kind of what we do. You know, we don't really treat, unless we have something, which I've said in the past, like unless we have something that's like absolutely demolishing an entire crop, um, we don't pursue anything to treat it, even organic remedies in most cases. Now, if like all of, you saw some of my squash right now have powdery mildew, if all of a sudden all of my squash have powdery mildew, we might do something like a diluted peroxide spray or something like that. Um, it's like, I'd say it's 50-50 intentional and laziness or like lack of time. Um, so I really do want to kind of cultivate a space that takes care of itself and is really regenerative in and of itself. And that's why we're planting a lot of perennials in the potager garden and trying to do things that, um, offer support to each other. You know, a lot of like placing crops near each other that help each other out or that, you know, attract beneficial insects that maybe target the pests of another, another plant. We do kind of all of that forward thinking and that kind of strategy beforehand so that once we're into the season, we're really just doing some like light maintenance and pruning. We're not, you know, going out and treating every day. There are some things that I kind of keep in my bag of my bag of tricks that we'll spray when needed. You know, we sprayed BT once this year on our um, on our brassicas when those cabbage worms really came out in full force. Now, granted, we did it too late and the damage was already done, um, but that's something I will do usually like once a season. I keep diatomaceous earth in the garage if we end up with you know um, sometimes we'll have like ants that move in and usually I'll just put some diatomaceous earth down and then they kind of move out. Um, but those are really the extent. I mean, I have neem oil. Sometimes I'll spray neem oil. Uh, I, in the past, have like played around with different essential oil blends like rosemary and peppermint and like spraying around my plants. But what I found is that at the scale that I'm gardening at, um, most of the time a pest is not going to take out everything that I have planted. So I kind of leave it to nature to bring in the other things. And I found it really cool that, you know, on years where I am struggling with an aphid problem, the ladybugs move in um, and, and it's just a really cool way to experience nature even beyond just creation. So anyways, that's my two cents. Now we do do things like go hunt hornworms, but we only usually do that two or three times a season if we're seeing dramatic damage. So it's nothing we would spray for. We're not going to, you know, take any drastic measures to catch these hornworms that we didn't catch this time. Um, but that's kind of our philosophy when it comes to gardening. Now, obviously this is, everybody's gonna have their own take, right? Your situation is gonna be different than mine. If you're you know, farming on a really large scale and you're doing it for profit, you can't afford to lose your crop. Um, you can't afford to wait seven years to kind of let the, uh, you know, the, the harmonious relationships develop. You can't afford that. And so I think that it, it's different in every season that you're in, your approach is gonna be a little bit different. And for me in this season, that's the approach that I'm taking. Now, if you just have one or two containers on your back patio and, you know, you are just nurturing your one tomato plant, hoping to get some fruit off of it, then absolutely. If you start to see hornworms or if you start to see, you know, different pest pressure, um, 
you know, spray neem oil, sprinkle diatomaceous earth. You're not gonna hurt your plants doing that. You're not gonna, those are all really organic and clean options. You're not gonna expose yourself or your family to anything that, you know, is outside of things that you are exposed to every single day, just being alive in 2021. Um, and so there's no judgment. Um, it, Garden how you need to garden and do what you need to do to get to the finish line. I am just sharing what we're doing here and kind of why we're doing it. And I want to encourage you, try it a different way, right? Um, when we first started gardening, we had no concept of what really anything. I mean, I think if you're just now exposing yourself to kind of the concept of sustainability and homesteading and gardening, then there's a lot of things you just don't really know out of the box. You know, I, for a long time, you know, I, I've had friends who work in the food industry and a lot of people say like, there's no difference, organic, conventional, no difference. Obviously I know that that's not true. I know that having, you know, been to organic farms and kind of experienced what they're doing, are they all doing it correctly and sustainably? Absolutely not. Buying organic does not mean that you're buying sustainable, but the chemicals that are allowed in conventional farming and con conventionally grown um, produce are not chemicals that I want to readily expose my family to outside of what we're already exposed to and everything else that we're doing. So um, things like Roundup and, you know, different herbicides and pesticides and, and things that are just accepted in conventional farming are not things that I really want to expose my family to. And so we make decisions to purchase organically when we are purchasing from other farms but then even more than that, we make a decision to support local farms that are practicing regenerative agriculture and sustainable concepts and diversity on their farms and, and, and really focusing on soil health and things like that. And that's what I want to bring to my own garden too. So, you know, when we first started gardening, we didn't know better things like seven dust or like these magic solutions that just take care of all of the pests. They exist, right? Um, but I want to encourage you to take a look at what's in them and decide for yourself if that's something that you feel like is beneficial to the earth and to your family um, and make the decision. You know, we're all just getting better every single day. Five years ago, maybe more than that, maybe 10 years ago, if you would have come and asked me, I would have said that there's no value in buying organic. It's all just a marketing ploy. Um, and we had candles everywhere and we were spraying Febreze in the house. And you know, those are things that we don't do today because when you know better, you do better. And the more that I started diving into the research and the more that I started really looking at what I was exposing my family to and you know, what, what we were exposing the earth to, I decided that, you know, a difference doesn't just happen overnight. And every single person that makes a decision to make a change is valuable. And that means that if, if we were just one family that stopped, you know, our use of chemicals like Febreze or Roundup or whatever, insert, fill in the blank, that that did make a difference. And I want to be part of, I want to be on the right side of history, right? I want to be on the right side of the movement to protect the place that we all live in. So I'll get off my soapbox now. That is that is a huge reason that we choose to garden organically on our farm. Um, but, you know, I think that as long as you're growing something and you're getting out there and you're trying your best, like you are making a difference. And every little action that you take is valuable. Whether that is, you know, just choosing to grow a couple of vegetables, you're making a difference and that food, even if it's not grown organically, even if you do, you know, have to use some conventional practices or you just feel like that's right for you in this season right now, that food has a shorter time to your table. It's still going to be healthier for you than other conventionally grown fruits and vegetables that you could buy at the store. So I think that, you know, it all comes down to each of us kind of checking ourselves and figuring out, you know, how, how are we doing our part to make the world a better place and how are we doing our part to really impact food sustainability in our communities and for me that's going to look different than it does for you but I'm glad that I get to share it and I hope that we can have a conversation and challenge each other on our thoughts and our beliefs and ultimately come out of this better so long way to say our horn 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 worm hunting last night was not super successful, but that's why we do it. And we will always choose to pick bugs off by hand versus spray or, you know, do something like that. So 
just a little food for thought. Now, speaking of food, I am trying a new sourdough pizza dough recipe and it's a five hour recipe, which I'm very excited about. You guys have been asking for some more sourdough videos. So I will, if it's successful, I will show you how I make it in a later video. Um, I'll go ahead and link the recipe that I started with. So I'm one of those cooks that I'll start with a recipe, but that is by no means where I end. I kind of take it and make it my own, even the first time I'm making it, which results in really good food and sometimes not so good food. But one of the things I absolutely love about this season in the garden is that we have so much fresh greenery and herbs coming out of the garden that are perfect for a homemade pizza. So Sundays are our pizza night. Today is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And so I'm trying this new sourdough recipe and I'm really excited to put some fresh basil from the garden on it. But let me show you what it looks like. This is off, it's just warming. Look at that. Mm. Friends, thank you for joining me today. As we did some hornworm hunting, talked a little bit more about sustainability and organic gardening, and made some delicious pizza that we are gonna devour in just a minute. You always have a space here in my house, in my garden, and on our farm. Until next time. Say bye, friends.